Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah. May Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. <clears throat> this evening, I was asked to deliver a, ta- a lecture on the ideal Muslim student. And I think you're all aware of that, right? The subtitle which I'm giving to this presentation is the Taliban. I'm going to talk to you this evening about the Taliban. But from a unique perspective, not the Taliban you're thinking of in Afghanistan and Pakistan. No, there's another Taliban that you should be aware of. In Arabic, the word which is used for student is what? Talib. Right? The word for student is Talib. And in Arabic, when you have two students, that's called what? Hmm? Taliban. So we're going to talk about the Taliban, the two students. What two students am I going to talk about? The first type of student is a student who happens to be a Muslim. And the other student I'm going to talk about is a Muslim who happens to be a student. Do we hear the two? Students now, the Taliban. Who are the Taliban? The Taliban consists of the student who happens to be a Muslim. And the Muslim who happens to be a student. Both of them we call, in English, Muslim students. But actually, there is a difference between the two. The student who happens to be a Muslim could just as well have been a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Christian or an atheist. He or she is fundamentally a student. And religion is of no real consequence. It doesn't matter. It's not important. In fact, it's irrelevant to being a student in the eye of the student who happens to be a Muslim. Religion for that student is merely culture. The type of food you eat, the type of dress you wear, how you get married, and how you get buried. That's as far as religion, Islam, goes to the student who happens to be a Muslim. So if one were to observe that student who happens to be a Muslim, one would not find any difference between such a student and other students of different cultural, religious, or national backgrounds. One wouldn't find much difference between them. They're virtually the same. On the other hand, the Muslim who happens to be a student is primarily a Muslim. He or she could have been a teacher, a doctor, a taxi driver, a maid, or anything. There would not be any significant difference between them except in the location where they are functioning. The difference between a Muslim who happens to be a doctor and a Muslim who happens to be a student is only the location, what they are involved in. But the fundamental basis is the same. So a Muslim is a Muslim wherever she or he may be, in whatever walk of life they may end up. 
because that true Muslim has as his or her primary goal the need to serve Allah to worship God in whatever capacity they find themselves in and the aim of such a student the Muslim who happens to be a student is to turn whatever aspect of life that they're involved in into worship this is the goal as Allah said the motto of the Muslim is قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ this is the motto of the believer, the true Muslim. That is, indeed my prayers, my sacrifices, my living and my dying are for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. So, that student who is a Muslim first and foremost, realizes that seeking knowledge is a means to worship Allah. The Muslim who happens to be a student realizes that being a student seeking knowledge because that's what a student does. That's why in Arabic he's called or she is called Talib. Talib means one who seeks. And that is why Prophet Muhammad ﷺ had said طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمْ Seeking knowledge, being a student, being a talib or a talibah, is obligatory on every Muslim. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the Muslim student, the one who is a Muslim first and happens to be a student, is one who is in fact fulfilling an obligation which the Prophet ﷺ had put on us. It is an obligation, a religious obligation. He called it Farida. Farida. That means obligation. Fardain. It is an individual obligation on each and every Muslim to seek knowledge. Furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ promised paradise. He promised paradise for one who makes the effort, who sets out seeking knowledge. He promised paradise. He said, مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Whoever sets out on a path seeking knowledge, Allah will make the path to paradise easy for them. That's a big reward. And for sure, I'm sure you have no doubt that if the consequence, the reward of seeking knowledge is paradise, then surely seeking knowledge must be a form of worshipping Allah. It must be ibadah. Because only ibadah is going to get us to paradise. Ada, mu'amala, the business that we do, the positions that we get, the things we buy, these are not going to get us to paradise. These are things we have to do in this life to survive. But they're not going to get us to paradise. What will get us to paradise is worshipping Allah, ibadah. So if Prophet Muhammad ﷺ has promised us paradise for seeking knowledge, setting out in a path seeking knowledge, then it must be ibadah. So the student who is a Muslim first, a Muslim who happens to be a student, he or she realizes this. They understand this, they have internalized it, meaning they have understood it and they live it.
Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had also said concerning one who seeks knowledge, that's out in the path seeking knowledge, that the angels will lower their wings because of their pleasure with one who seeks knowledge and forgiveness will be asked for him by the inhabitants of the heavens and the earth and the fish in the depths of the ocean. Allah's creatures will ask for forgiveness for that individual. So seeking knowledge is also a means of purification from sin. That Allah's creatures beg Him to forgive that individual who sets out on the path of knowledge. And the Prophet ﷺ declared such a person who goes out on the path and gets the knowledge as superior to those who just stay at home and pray. They stay at home in their lands, they don't make any effort, don't go out of their way to try to gain knowledge, but they just pray. They don't do anything bad, they're praying in the mosque and they're living their basic lives. Prophet ﷺ said, وَإِنَّ فَضْلَ الْعَالِمْ عَلَى الْعَابِدِ كَفَضْلِ الْقَمَرِ لَيْلَةَ الْبَدْرِ عَلَى سَائِرِ الْكَوَاكِبِ The superiority of the learned man, the learned individual, over the devout is like that of the moon over the stars. The superiority of the learned over the devout, the devout meaning just a person who worships God, stays at home, doesn't make the effort to try to get that knowledge. It's like the moon over the stars. The full moon. Right? The full moon. Laylatul Badr. This is the night of the full moon. Compare that to the stars. When the full moon is not around, then the stars shine. You can see them. When the full moon is out, it's like the stars, you can hardly see them anymore. Full moon overshadows them. And this is the characteristic which Prophet Muhammad gave to those who go out seeking knowledge. And that is of course in keeping with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about those who are knowledgeable. He said, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهِ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء Only the knowledgeable truly fear Allah among His servants. Only the knowledgeable truly fear Allah among His servants. What does that mean? It means that those who have knowledge, who know who Allah is, fear Him based on that real knowledge. Those who don't have the knowledge, they fear Him because everybody else fears Him. The people around them say, fear him, so they fear him. Now if the people around them say, don't, you don't need to fear him, then they, maybe they won't fear him. Because their fear is not based on knowledge. When the fear is based on knowledge, then that person will fear Allah under all circumstances. Because they know why they're fearing Allah. But if you don't know why you're fearing Allah, then it's easy not to fear Him. Fearing Him meaning doing what He tells us to do. Now maybe you're doing what He tells us to do because mom and dad are watching you. But if mom and dad are not watching you, as they say, when the cat's away, the mice will play. Okay? So when mom and dad aren't watching you, then you do things you're not supposed to do. Why? Because you're not fearing Allah based on knowledge. You're fearing Allah based on your fear of your parents. Fear of their disapproval. So when they're not around, you don't, you're not afraid that they will disapprove, then no problem. But if you really know, when your parents said, don't do this thing, they explain to you why you shouldn't do it. And you understood why you shouldn't do it. Then whether they're around or they're not around, then you're not going to do it. That is the difference of knowledge, that knowledge makes. That we do the right thing for the right reasons.
not the wrong reasons. Also, Allah said in Surah Zumar, Qul, hal yastawi alladheena ya'lamoon wa alladheena la ya'lamoon? Say, are those who know equal to those who do not know? No. Those who know are not equal to those who do not know. Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, in describing this world, he lifted the student up on a pedestal, on a podium, put the student in a special place among one of the few blessed creatures in this earth. He said, Ad-dunya mal'una, mal'unun ma fiha. This world is cursed. And whatever is in it is also cursed. Illa dhikrullah, except for the remembrance of Allah. Everything in this world is cursed except for the remembrance of Allah. وَمَا وَلَا And whatever helps us to remember Allah. Except for the remembrance of Allah and what helps us to remember Allah. Then what? وَعَالِمًا وَمُتَعَلِّمًا The alim, the knowledgeable, the teacher, وَمُتَعَلِّمًا And the student. That's a very heavy hadith. Everything in this world is cursed except for the remembrance of Allah and what helps us to remember Allah and the teacher and the student. The knowledgeable scholar and the student. So the student is in a very special place. And of course, this is related back to the creation of Adam, where Allah elevated Adam over the angels for what reason? Why? What was the evidence that He elevated them? وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Allah taught Adam the names of all things. Knowledge. Adam was the first student. Allah taught him the knowledge of this world. Knowledge of the things of this world. And that elevated him to the point where the angels had to accept that Adam was superior to them. They were not able to understand Adam. Whatever they imagined about Adam could not be depended upon. So, Knowledge in this world, all of it comes from Allah. And it comes from Allah in two ways. Now as students, it's important for us to understand this. There are two ways in which the knowledge comes from Allah. One way is by way of revelation. Revelation, Allah communicates His will to His creatures directly through the angel, through the prophets. The books of Revelation revealed knowledge. That's one way. Revealed knowledge. The other way is what we call acquired knowledge. We acquire it through efforts. You research, you study, you think, you try this out, you try that out, something works, now you have some real knowledge of the world. But in the end, though you have made the effort, it is still Allah who allowed you to find that out. Because many people will try to find out something, but they don't. One person does. When you look at most of the major inventions, the most of the major discoveries. How did they discover these things? Was it because they had a planned direction of research and they were researching along and they finally came to the end? Yes, that happens sometimes. But most of the times, it's by accident. They call it by accident. 
Meaning, for example, Madame Curie. What is Madame Curie famous for? Radium. Radium and? What do we get from radium? Huh? What do we get from radium? What is the value of radium? How do we use radium today? Huh? Medical in what way? What way in the medical? X-rays. Who said that? Who said X-rays? You said X-rays? Give her a prize. Madame Curie was famous for x-rays. How did she discover the x-rays? How did she discover x-rays? She was in her lab doing something. She had some radium in the corner. She had some exposed uh, film and her hand happened to pass between the radium and the exposed film and she saw in the exposed film the bones of her hand by accident she wasn't planning she wasn't trying to see how can I see the bones of my hand she was trying different chemicals and metals and see what to, no it just happened by accident as they say but it means what Allah chose to reveal that knowledge at that time and if you go to all of your major discoveries you'll find similar accidents, quote-unquote accidents, behind them. The biggest ones. So, we have what we call revealed knowledge, and we have acquired knowledge. Now, revealed knowledge is what is compulsory on us. When Prophet Muhammad said, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيدَ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ Seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. That is primarily revealed knowledge knowledge of the religion of Islam to know what is required of you to be able to do the right thing that much knowledge you need to know you don't need to know the knowledge of all of Islam because if you sat down and tried to study all of Islam they would put the dirt in your grave seal your grave and you still hadn't found it because the knowledge is a huge ocean. So, what is required of you is what you need to do what Allah requires of you. So, for example, you're going to go on Umrah. Your parents say, let's go on Umrah. What do you do? Do you go to Umrah, bumble around asking people, what do I do now? You know, it's, oh, people are doing this, let's go do that. And, at the end of it, you come back and you ask the scholar, did I do it right? Huh? Was I supposed to have been doing that? I have some doubt in my mind about what I did there. Was that an Umrah? Was that acceptable? No, no, that's not the way we do it. What we do is, you're going to go and make Umrah, then you need to find out about Umrah first. Before you set out, you sit down, you read the books, you sit under the scholars, you learn everything you can about Umrah, then you go and make Umrah. That's the way to do it, isn't it? That's what we do for everything else. If we're going to start a business, do we just go and set up the business, pay money and buy parts and this stuff, and just to see, will it work? No, no. We check the market, we see if there's a market for this, and you know, we do all we planning and research and everything we can. When we feel certain this is going to work, then we go ahead and we set up our business. You must have knowledge about what you're going to do, otherwise you're going to make a mess. What this is, is that you're planning to do something, right? You want to do something. If you don't plan to do it, they say, if you fail to plan, you, who said that? You said that? Give him the prize. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail.
Only one prize left. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Very basic principle. So, when we talk about Islamic knowledge, that's what we're talking about. The knowledge necessary for you to do what you have to do. Now, for example, there are books available and lectures being given on marriage. But, how old are you? You're 12. Do you need to go and study these things now? Do you need to go read a book on marriage and go attend all the lectures on marriage? What do you think? I mean, unless you're planning to get married this year, no. So, it's not something you need to know right now. Yes, it's part of Islamic knowledge, but it's not required knowledge for you because you're not, there's no, you know, you've got so many years ahead of you before you're getting into it. But, when the time comes for you to get married, then yeah, you need to read about marriage and understand it properly to do it properly. Otherwise, you go in and make a mess. Right? So this is, the, this is how we approach the knowledge of Islam. Whatever we need to know, to do whatever we are planning to do properly, meaning in a way which is pleasing to Allah, then we need to get that knowledge. So, as students, you are students in school, then you need to know certain knowledge. You need to have the knowledge necessary to get you through your school days as students who pleased the law. Not necessarily having the top mark, because remember, having the top mark, this may go to who? It may go to the student who happened to be a Muslim, because he or she what? Cheated. Yeah. Cheating is big business. People pay a lot of money. Do all kinds of things to cheat to get the best mark. So yes, you may not get that best mark because you didn't engage yourself in what is displeasing to Allah. But know that when you graduate, earning whatever you have earned honestly, then you have succeeded in the sight of Allah. You have succeeded in the sight of Allah. So when we come to knowledge, as students, you should be aware that knowledge is divided into two categories. There is what is known as true knowledge, and there's another category called false knowledge. You need to know what is true knowledge, what is false knowledge. You may have to learn both, but you have to be able to put true knowledge in its correct perspective and false knowledge in its correct perspective. For example, what is false knowledge? An example of false knowledge, somebody can give me an example? Huh? Cheating? No, no, no. Black magic, magic yes. Black magic would be considered to be a part of false knowledge. Black magic. But I don't think unless you're into the Harry Potter school, um, you're going to be coming across that one, right? But in terms of our day-to-day -day school situation, there are some things we are learning in school which come under the heading of false knowledge. Can somebody give me an example? Yes. What is that called? The theory of? Darwin's theory of evolution. This is a part of false knowledge. A big part of false knowledge. The idea that our great grandparents were monkeys. We're apes, living in trees. This idea 
is false knowledge. Oh yes, they're digging up bones every day. They're digging up bones all over the place. You know, which they say is evidence showing and proving, etc. No. It's false knowledge, what they're claiming. The evidence is real. We cannot deny if they've dug up a skull or bones and body parts or these kind of things. We cannot deny that these may have been creatures that lived a million years ago or whatever if they've done the scientific test and proven it to be true. And of course, every now and then you hear about somebody who falsified information. So you have a bunch of false information in this area. But even so, leave the false information aside. There is something which is real and true. The dinosaurs. We see the dinosaurs, you know, the, the bones and the stone, and we see all these things. So it's there. There's, there's evidence there. But the question is, what does that evidence prove? Does the evidence prove what they claim it to prove? Evolution? No. All the evidence proves is that there were creatures that lived on this earth, and they died out. The fact that they have similar features or similar forms doesn't necessarily mean they're related. For example, you've heard about the rhinoceros, right? You heard about the rhinoceros, no? Right? You have a one-horned rhinoceros, you have a two-horned rhinoceros. Fairly big, heavy, couple of tons, you know, animal. There is also a beetle called the rhinoceros beetle. Have you ever seen the rhinoceros beetle? No? Well, the rhinoceros beetle is a fairly big beetle, and it has on the front part where the head is two uh, spikes which look like horns, looking just like the horns and the rhinoceros, just a small version. But nobody says that this rhinoceros beetle is related to the rhinoceros. Nobody argues that point. So, simply because there are similarities in forms, it doesn't mean that we are related, meaning one came from the other. So because monkeys and gorillas and apes, yeah, they have five fingers, they have a nose and a mouth, their eyes are in the front, not in the back of their heads. You know? Some of them do run around on two feet. It still doesn't mean that we are related to them. So, the theory of evolution, as it is called a theory, this is a part of false knowledge. Because they're promoting a particular agenda. Something they believe in, and they're just gathering the evidence, manipulating it to support their argument. Also, a part of false knowledge is the idea of creation of life. The idea that scientists are able or will be able to create life. Way back in the 60s, before you guys were born, maybe even before you were thought of, meaning your parents didn't even get married yet, back in the 60s, when they first did what they call in vitro fertilization. In vitro fertilization. You all know what that is? No? In vitro fertilization means they take a sperm from a man, an ovum from a woman, put them together in a test tube, and from it an embryo starts. So the big headlines when they first succeeded in doing it back in the 60s, it said, Scientists create the first test tube baby. Now when you hear scientists create the first test tube baby, what does that sound like? Sounds like in the lab, they got some chemicals, right? Because we're made up of what? We're made up of calcium and of sodium and of, you know. So they got all these chemicals, they figured out the proportions, put it in a test tube, put it under the, the Bunsen burner, heated it up and out popped the baby. Right? That's what it sounded like. People, were, when they heard that, they thought that's what it was. But reality, that's not what it was at all. They didn't create life. 
they took life which was already there and another life which was already there they put them together and it produced another life and that's what they did all they did was manipulate, they didn't create, but they put it initially for the masses of people, scientists create life in a test tube, the test tube baby. Nonsense. So we have to be very careful when we're studying, because a lot of what we're studying ends up science. Science is coming at us. And they want to give, give this impression that human beings can do anything. The other thing that they search for in, in, in false uh, knowledge is the cure for death. It's another area, a cure for death. So nobody will ever die. Cloning, they're talking about, yes, cloning. We can do cloning to, you know, live forever. You do what you do, you take a piece of yourself, right? Some cells, clone another you, right? Keep, keep that you in a, some kind of a frozen whatever. When the time comes, when your heart gets weak, you need a new heart, okay? Take the body out. Take out the heart, replace your heart. Right? Spare parts. So you can live on forever. Right? This is falsehood. Everybody is going to die. As Allah said, Kullu nafsin maut. Every soul will die. So this is false knowledge. All the money and the effort they're spending for it, it will lead them nowhere. Because they, there is no cure for death. Prophet Muhammad said that. He said, Allah, for every single disease which Allah has sent among human beings, He sent a cure. Except for death. No cure for that one. Everybody is going to die. So this is like false knowledge. So as you study, I'm just giving you some examples. There are other examples, many other examples. You have to be aware of false knowledge. Why especially? In the past... Muslim scientists, Muslim students didn't have to be as aware as you have to be today. Why? Because the books were written by Muslim scientists. So when you study the textbook of, of biology or geology or whatever, these were written by Muslim scientists who feared Allah and who gave you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Whereas today, where are your notebooks, your school books written? They're written in Britain or America or Australia, or someplace else. Even in India, written in India, but written by who? By Muslims? No. So it means that whatever they're giving you, there may be a body of true knowledge there, but be sure that false knowledge is coming along with it. So you have to be careful, like no generation before had to be. Now, if we go leave the false knowledge, and go over to what we call the true knowledge. That true knowledge can also be divided into two categories. Yeah, there are two categories of true knowledge. One category is called useful knowledge. Useful, beneficial. The other category is called useless knowledge, not beneficial. Not serving any real purpose. For Muslims, when we talk about seeking knowledge, we're talking about acquired knowledge now. We leave the obligatory knowledge, which is revealed knowledge, leave that aside. We're now looking at acquired knowledge because that's what you're doing in school right now, right? You are getting acquired knowledge. Of that acquired knowledge, you need to focus yourself. You need to focus yourself. What area are you going to focus your studies in? It should be in the useful knowledge. Okay, what's, give me an example of useless knowledge. Somebody have an example of useless knowledge? Pardon? The, history. Wars of the past in history. No, it's not useless knowledge. Because don't we read about the the battles of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba and all these, we read this. There's knowledge, there's useful knowledge in there because one, it shows us how Allah has supported the believers at different times. He showed us what happens when people, you know, like in the battle of Uhud when they didn't follow the instructions of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, how they were defeated. There are lessons in there. So we won't say history 
is false knowledge. No. If it's false history, yes, it's false knowledge. Not useful. But if it is true history, there is a benefit in it. Because what is the Quran? What is the Quran in terms of about a third, a quarter to a third of the Quran is what? History. History of the prophets, history of the righteous people of the past, etc. No, no, not history. Useless knowledge. An example. No, no, we said that was false knowledge. Fear is a revolution. This is false knowledge. We're looking for useless knowledge. It's not false, it's true, but it's useless. For example, let me give you an example. Huh? Architecture? No, 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 no. Architecture is useful knowledge. You know, that's, uh, if we didn't have knowledge of architecture, hey, we would not be in this place, we'd be in a hut, you know? Uh, just a trunk of a, of a palm tree, we'd stick it up this way and stick another one that way and put some palm branches on top, you know? Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do this. This is architecture, no. Architecture is useful knowledge. In fact, architecture, when we talk about this, this acquired knowledge, we're talking really about an element of knowledge which is also obligatory on the community. Knowledge of architecture is obligatory on the community as a whole. What they call fard kifaya. As long as some Muslims become architects, then that's enough. Because they can build the homes for everybody else. Not everybody has to be an architect. But knowledge of architecture is a part of required knowledge. Of the acquired knowledge. So that's not useless knowledge. I'll give you the example, since we can't find it here. Knowledge of the composition of dirt on Mars. That's useless knowledge. Right now, America has sent rocket ships over the last years. They've sent rocket ships, rovers, roving around on Mars, you know, doing experiments, checking the dirt to find out the composition of dirt on Mars. They've spent billions of dollars. We say, as Muslims, that is useless knowledge. It's knowledge. It's real, it's true, but it's useless. Why? Because in America today, more than four million of its inhabitants are homeless. Now in India, we know Calcutta. Calcutta was sort of like, in the world, looked at as the example of homeless people living in the streets. They call it the black hole of Calcutta. It's written in novels by the British. <laughs> Calcutta was the epitome of homelessness. People just living in the streets. But actually, in America, more than 4 million. America, remember, is the most powerful, richest nation on the earth. More than 4 million of its inhabitants live in the streets. Yes, I know you saw the Empire State Building and the Twin Towers before they were knocked down. And others, huge, wonderful towers and buildings. They look beautiful in the postcards and the travel brochures. But if you go to these buildings, till now, you go to, these, go to Chicago, go to New York, go to Washington, go to uh, San Francisco, go to these huge buildings and look at night. When people go home, they've left their offices and gone home, you will see people taking out bits and pieces of cardboard and lying down sleeping on the sidewalk. More than 4 million Americans are homeless, living in the streets of America. They spent way over $4 billion to go to Mars, to check out dirt on Mars. So what do you say? What is that? Does it make sense? You've got $4 billion plus. You're going to spend that on dirt on Mars? Or do you spend it for the homeless people in your own country? Homeless people. That's common sense. That's common sense. So we say knowledge about the composition of dirt on Mars is useless knowledge at this time. If in the future we fill up the earth, we have no place left to put people, and we have to go look for some place else, okay, let's go check out Mars. Okay, now is the time we go check out the composition of dirt on Mars. Can we plant plants there and that? Can we, you know, but not now. So, in terms of, we just looked at basically the acquisition of knowledge. 
and its priorities. Now, we're going to look at the last four points that I'd like to share with you this evening concerning seeking knowledge. The ideal Muslim student. What he or she needs to be aware of. First, the goal. As we said from all that we looked at just now, the goal of knowledge is its application. The goal from getting the knowledge is to be able to apply it, not merely to get knowledge, just to have it. In the West, they have a saying concerning knowledge. They say, knowledge for the sake of knowledge. That's what took them to Mars to find out about the composition of dirt on Mars. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge, just to have that knowledge. We say, no, no, knowledge for its benefit. If it has a benefit, a direct benefit, then we get that knowledge. If it has no benefit, then we leave it. We don't need it. The Prophet ﷺ had said, the best of you is one who learns the Qur'an and teaches it to others. The best of you is one who learns the Qur'an and teaches it to others. He also said, the best of you is the one who is most beneficial to people. The best of you is one most beneficial to people. So our goal from knowledge as students is to find beneficial, useful knowledge to be able to benefit others, ourselves and others. And this is why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said, we used to learn the Qur'an, 10 verses at a time. And we did not proceed to another set of verses until we learned the knowledge that was there and acted upon it. So we used to learn knowledge and its application together. That's how they learned the Qur'an. Today, we learn the Qur'an, memorize huge portions of the Qur'an, etc., and we don't even know what Allah is saying in it. We've gotten away from the original way. The Prophet ﷺ had said, The best of you is one who learns the Qur'an and teaches it to others. The best of you is one who learns the Qur'an and teaches it to others. He also said, The best of you as the one who is most beneficial to people. The best of you is one most beneficial to people. So our goal from knowledge as students is to find beneficial, useful knowledge to be able to benefit others, ourselves and others. And this is why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said we used to learn the Qur'an 10 verses at a time. And we did not proceed to another set of verses until we learned the knowledge that was there and acted upon it. So we used to learn knowledge and its application together. That's how they learned the Quran. Today, we learn the Quran, memorize huge portions of the Quran, etc. And we don't even know what Allah is saying in it. We've gotten away from the original way. Sufyan al-Thawri, he is a famous scholar from the time of Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik and others. He said, as a youth, when I first set out to seek knowledge, Abu Sufyan, when he first set out seeking knowledge, his mother said to him, if you write down 10 words and your faith has not improved, then check yourself. If you write down 10 words, and your faith has not improved, then check yourself. Meaning that the knowledge that you're gaining should have some impact on yourself. It should make you a better person. If you're not improving, then it means that you are not gaining the knowledge as it should be gained. And we know, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ had said, the first three people who are thrown in the hellfire will include scholar yes among the first three people thrown in the hellfire 
will be a scholar, scholar of Islam, a mujahid, one who fought for the sake of Allah, a martyr and died, and who was the third? Huh? Pardon? Yeah, a philanthropist. One who was generous. He had money and he gave. Gave people. Why did the Prophet ﷺ said among the first three people going to hell would be these people? He said so because they did it. The good deeds they did was for what? To show off. So that people would praise them, admire them, say what a learned person this man is. What a generous person that person is. What a great warrior that other one is. They were doing it to be praised by people. So they became among the first thrown in hell. So it means that seeking knowledge, one must be sincere. We have to be sincere in that seeking of knowledge. The second point that we need to note is that we have to work hard at it. We have to work hard at it. As students, there are many shortcuts. Among them, we talked about cheating. People offer different ways to get around doing what you have to do. Assignments are given. Reality, as a student, a Muslim student, you must try to do your best. As the Prophet ﷺ had said, "In Allah yuhibbu min ahadikum ida amila amalan an yutqina." That Allah loves from each and every one of you. If you do anything, you do it to the best of your ability. So you have to do the best you can. Do the assignments the best way you can. Do all the research. Do whatever you have to do. Homework. Do it. In class, pay attention. Answer the questions when you're asked. Do the best you can. That is a necessity for being a true Muslim student. Also, you have to have an open mind. As we said, if you're going to be able to reject false knowledge and useless knowledge, your mind must be open. You don't just swallow everything that is given to you. You have to distinguish. You have to discern what is acceptable and what is not. And you have to be honest. Prophet ﷺ was known as Al-Ameen, the trustworthy. And dishonesty is one of the signs of hypocrisy. That is a person only pretending to be a Muslim. They're Muslim in name, they're Muslim from Muslim family, maybe it's written on their passport, but they're not really Muslims. They're fake, false, counterfeit Muslims. And the last point is respect for the teachers. Prophet Muhammad and said, whoever does not respect our elders, have mercy on our children, and recognize the rights of our scholars is not of us. So when you enter a class, you must respect your teachers. If you can't respect your teacher, then you will not learn from them. You will not learn properly from them. So respect is required from the religion as a Muslim. Even if everybody else in the class is making fun of the teacher and you know, playing tricks against the teacher, etc. Don't join in. Don't be involved in it. Your responsibility is to respect that teacher, to get the knowledge that he or she has to give, and benefit from it, and be able to benefit others. And in closing, the last point that we need to keep in mind as students who are Muslims first, is that we as Muslims have a mission in life. The rest of the creation, the animals, they are only to serve us. As believers in God, true servants of God, we have a mission. That mission is to worship Allah and to convey the responsibility of worshiping God to the rest of creation. 
da'wah. We have a responsibility to convey the word of Allah to those around us. We have a mission in life. We have a purpose. So when we gain the knowledge, we should use that knowledge in a way which is pleasing to Allah. We can benefit ourselves, but when we do so, it should be in legitimate business. Halal, not haram. Also, we should do voluntary work in the society. The whole society has contributed to us gaining the knowledge we have, giving us the positions that we have. We should give something back, voluntarily. Not expect reward and money for everything that we do. No. We should make some sacrifice for the community. And as I said, we have a responsibility to convey the knowledge we learn to others. So, in conclusion, in conclusion, going back to the beginning, we said this lecture was about the Taliban. Right? The Taliban. The two students, one who was a student who happened to be a Muslim, and the other who was a Muslim who happened to be a student. And that is what is in front of us, each and every one of us, to choose which one do we want to be. The one that is guaranteed success, obviously, is the Muslim who happens to be a student. So that's what my talk was about this evening. Encouraging you, advising you, showing you the way to be a student who is Muslim first. And that is the ideal student. The ideal Muslim student is one whose Islam takes precedence over all else. Now there may be circumstances where your Islam may collide with the world around you. And you may have to make some compromises. For example, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when he came amongst his companions and they stood up, some of them stood up, he told them, sit down, don't stand up for me. They said, but that's what they do in uh, the kings of Persia and so and so. And you are far greater than the kings of Persia, prophet of Allah. He said, no, I'm a servant of Allah. And whoever desires that people stand up for him in this life, will be standing in the hellfire in the next. It is forbidden, it is haram for a Muslim to stand up in honor to anyone but Allah. That's a big one, right? That's a big one because now when you go to school tomorrow and the teacher comes in the classroom and you don't stand up, there are major problems coming. Right? Major problems coming. So this is an example where what is pleasing to Allah and what is pleasing to the society come in conflict. So what do you do? Huh? What do you do? Huh? Well, your head of the CIS or whatever it is said, simply stand. <laughs> and the Prophet Sallallahu said, لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق No obedience should be given to Allah's creatures if it involves disobedience to the Creator. What do you say now? Sit? Okay. Simply sit. <laughs> well, it's a tough one, really. It's a tough one. My advice in such a circumstance is that 
if you have support that can protect or defend your taking that stance of not standing, then don't stand. Bring a letter from your parents. A letter from your parents because they have understood that you're not supposed to stand for anybody but Allah. That's Salah. Isn't that the, Qiyam is your first pillar of Salah. Qiyam belongs only to Allah. So if you have parents that are going to back you, right, then get a letter from them, take it to the school, let it go through the necessary administrative whatevers, and get yourself excused from standing. That's the safest way. That's the safest way. If you stood hating it in your heart, that's the weakest way. The weakest way. At least though you hated it in your heart. So still better than just accepting it and going along, not even feeling bad about it. The strongest way, I will leave that to you. But, as I said, in different circumstances, uh, you may have to make, as I said, certain compromises. And get the advice of those more knowledgeable around you before you make steps. Yes, you want to please Allah, you want to do the right thing. But maybe you haven't understood the ramifications the consequences, etc., of that thing that you want to do. So best you talk with your elders, your parents, the knowledgeable ones around you, etc. Get clarity before you step out. And that's why Allah said in the Quran, Fas'alu ahla dhikri in kuntum la ta'lamun. Ask those who know if you don't really know. Don't go and do it and then, uh oh, I guess I shouldn't have. Find out first. Plan, right? We said if you fail to plan, you, know, you plan to fail. Watch out. Okay, so uh, inshallah, that is the basic presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, how much time do we have for questions here? Huh? 20 minutes? All right, I'm sure you don't need 20 minutes. I think we've covered everything. But at least let's take about 5 or 10 minutes here if you have any questions. Thank you very much for delivering whatever lecture on this evening. Let's have an interaction with the doctor. If you want to ask anything, I'll do the mic. yourself and what? And greet him? No, no, this, um, what you mentioned, uh, respect to elders, respect to parents, of course this is throughout the Quran. Uh, there is no such mention in the Quran that if you're sitting in a group and somebody comes you should rise to greet them. There's no such uh, reference. No, not even in the Hadith. I mean, what it is is that if somebody comes from a journey that you get up to meet them. Yeah, that's to greet them. That's a different thing. That's not considered standing in their honor. Right? Getting up to meet and to greet is okay. But just standing there, meaning you stand, you know, to honor that person and that you will not sit until they sit. 
You know, that is what is not permissible. And um, we can say also, even in terms of uh, the standing, that uh, if Prophet Muhammad forbade his own companions for standing for him, do you think there should be anybody we should stand for? So, what about standing for when the national anthem is on or something like that? Same thing. Standing for the national anthem, same story. There was a famous uh, basketball player from Chicago. His name was Abdurrahman. What was his name? Abdurrahman, somebody the other. Huh? No, no, no. He's a Muslim. He get converted to Islam. And whenever the national anthem was played, he used to sit. And people noticed it, you know. And it wasn't until, you know, some Jews decided to make a thing about it. And it became over in the news and they really focused on him. And he ended up having to, you know, leave the team, etc. Because he refused to stand. No, standing for the national anthem is the same thing. And even when you talk about honoring parents, you see, in some places, some customs, people kiss the feet of their parents. I think we know about that, right? Hmm? They go put their heads right down on their feet. So, if that is the custom, are you going to do it? That's prostration. That's even worse. Far worse than just standing. So, we don't use the excuse that it is pleasing parents or respect to parents. No. If respect to parents means disrespect to Allah, we don't do it. If respect to the national anthem means disrespect to Allah, we don't do it. But again, you better plan things properly first. If you're going to be running into administration and problems that come with that, you know, I'm not um, uh, saying for you to try to rebel against the whole system of your school or whatever, you know, back yourself up properly first. You know, get the support of your parents, your Islamic studies teacher, whatever, you know, get this, you know, get somebody behind you so when you decide not to do it, you know, you will not suffer. <laughs> okay? Assalamu alaikum. I have no intention of standing after you hearing your lecture, so I better ask the question sitting. I want to ask about the cloning part. You said that it's not, the way you said, I feel that it's not part of Islam, You, it's haram almost. But does practicing like that or being a scientist doing research in that or, you know, we are doing that to save humans, you know, transplanting the kidney from them, that is, we are saving the humans. So, doing such a field work, doing such a research, are we going against Islam? Are we supposed not to do like that as a Muslim scientist or a Muslim doctor? No, the research into cloning and, and other fields like this is perfectly legitimate where we have legitimate goals. For example, where cloning will produce a cow which will in its milk produce insulin because this was one of the goals that is perfectly legitimate because insulin benefits us so to clone for that goal is perfectly legitimate but when cloning becomes a means of trying to extend life beyond its uh, term that is the intent and the problem comes that when you clone yourself that body that you clone, can you say that's you? If life has come into it, spirit has been blown into it, is it yours to do with as you please? No, this is another human being. Just like a twin. One twin can't say this is my, you know, my twin here is my spare parts supply. No. So, where the goals are legitimate goals, just like for example plastic surgery. Plastic surgery now is basically used to make people look younger. You get older, you get bags under your eyes, okay move the bags, wrinkles on your forehead, remove the wrinkles, you know, face lifts, nose lifts, your nose is too big, make it smaller, if it's too small, make it bigger, you know, all these different things people doing, right? Michael Jackson, you know, all these things that people do, with, with uh, plastic surgery, this is haram. 
In Islam, it is haram, 100%. However, if plastic surgery is used for somebody who had a car accident, they burnt up half their face, they lost their ear, or, you know, different things like this happen, and you are doing what they call reconstructive surgery. You are replacing what has been lost, what has been damaged. You're born with a hair lip. Okay, they do plastic surgery and reconstructive surgery and make you able to speak properly and so on and so This is perfectly legitimate. So where we're doing and using these skills to benefit practically where there is a need, then it is legitimate. But when it comes to trying to change Allah's creation, then it becomes haram. So most of these areas, uh, modern science, scientific areas, you know, they are in a society which doesn't fear Allah, which is not guided by revelation. Naturally, there a lot of their um, products, a lot of their uh, activities become haram. They become displeasing to Allah because their goals are different. They're not about pleasing Allah, they're not about worshipping Allah, they're about this dunya. Whatever can make this dunya better for us, it's okay for us to do. There's no halal and haram. It's just whatever is good to us. Whatever we see as good is good. We should take one question from the males. Anybody this want to ask any question? This doesn't look very good. All the questions came from the females. I know they're getting the best results in your, you know, final examinations and everything, you know. But uh, try and do something here now. Our time something. is very less. If you want to ask, please make it fast. A sensible question, no? not just a question for the sake of a question. Assalamu alaikum. There's a study about stones and everything. That uh, it's useless or useful. Stones. Studies about stones. Stones. Yeah. Gemstones. Yeah, like that. Well, this is a part of the, we could say, zina or the. Um, Beautiful things, creation of beautiful things, development of beautiful things, which can help us um, in terms of just a question of pleasure mostly. Uh, if one takes that as a business, one takes it as a business, if one takes it as a business, then it's a legitimate business. People buy it, you know, etc sale etc but it's just the key for you as a muslim if you went into the gem industry that you be honest you know because there's a lot of dishonesty that goes on there right in the gem in industry you tell people you're selling them but this is how many carrots and it's not that many carrots and you know there are flaws in it they tell them it's perfect and you know all this cheating and stuff going on so if you become you know a gem dealer that you are an honest gem dealer So the knowledge that is involved in it there, we could say it has, you know, relative use. We won't say it's useless knowledge. It has use. A written question from girl side. Okay. There was a question from the girl side. Oh, this was sent in. Okay, question uh, concerning... Uh, boy-girl relationships having an intimate friend from the opposite sex a birth boyfriend or a girlfriend right. what do you think <laughs> yeah, it's prohibited okay those people who think that having for a boy to have a girlfriend that's an intimate friend and a girl to have a boyfriend is not against Islam and is okay, put your hand up. Honest, honest, be honest. Okay, we have one person 
who feels it is okay. Okay, one out of how many people here? 50 plus, whatever. So I think in general, we can say that everybody knows the answer to this question. But now, for the sake of you who said you felt it was okay, why do you feel so? If she is keeping that distance from a boy, as Islam says, and as Islam restricts us, if she is keeping a distance from the boy, and if she is uh, taking a friend as a boy, okay, it's okay. It's not becoming against Islam. As the rules per Islam said. Um, what does taking that boy as a friend mean? No, intimate friend means uh, just friend, we all know. No, no, intimate doesn't mean just friend. Intimate means you, you talk all the time, you are, you know, whatever is on your mind and whatever in your heart, you share it with them and, you know. No, you not in that way. No, that's what intimate means. No, that, <laughs> that goes to lover, right? <laughs> no, intimate friend means whatever, okay, we share our thoughts, but not such thoughts. Whatever we feel it's right, okay, we share. No, but this is not the intimate. But keeping a difference. Keeping a distance. Yes. But you see, then it's not intimate. Once you're keeping a distance, then it's no longer intimate. It's contradictory. You see, you, if you have an intimate friend, it's a person where there is no distance. They can be as close to you as you wish. No, it's not right. This is, inti this is your intimate friend who is close to you, you, wherever you go, they go, you, you know, whatever you have in your mind, you share with them, you know, this is your close friend. No, that's not no. right. Alright. So we can say that we're unanimous here, right? Everybody agrees that the answer to this question is, it's not permissible for a boy to have a girlfriend, an intimate girlfriend, and for a girl to have an intimate boyfriend. Why? Why? Huh? Custom? Is it just because of custom? Because, see, custom is something, you know, you might do for a while and later on when you don't feel this custom makes sense, you don't do it anymore. Well, you know, if you said that God says they can't be friends, we'd have to say, somebody would then ask you then, where does God say you can't be friends? You see, when I first asked, people said it was custom. Now you're saying God said, and, and I'm, I'm taking your side now. But you should have been arguing, right? And well, what's the proof? Where does God say that you can't be friends? No, but where does God say that? You have a verse from the Quran. You have a statement of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh, it's all the boys' fault then, right? Okay. <laughs> the girls, it's okay. The girls, they can be friends and keep it as friends, but the boys can't keep it as friends. Just friends. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's still, you know, I'm, again, why I'm, why I'm questioning this, right? Why I'm raising this to you? Because whatever we feel or we think is wrong or we're going to take a position that stands that is wrong, we should have some evidence for we should have some proof for. If we're just doing it because, as you said, custom, then when you get bigger, you get older, and you start to question that custom and you can't find any answers, then you're going to throw it away. Why keep it? Because custom is only good if it has meaning and benefit. If that custom produces something which is pleasing to Allah. 
If it doesn't produce something pleasing to Allah, then it is of no use. So, what we understand, that Islam in general has separated males from females. In Salah, why don't we pray men and women side by side? If there's no problem, if there's nothing to worry about, then we should be able to make salah side by side, men and women, but you know, no problem. This is what happens in the church. You know, when people go to the churches, you know, the Catholics, and they men and women are all together. But what is the consequence? What is the consequence? The consequence is that adultery and fornication spreads in the society. That is the consequence. When Prophet Muhammad was asked about the brother-in-law, and this is something very common amongst uh, people from the Indian subcontinent, where, for example, I'm married, and so-and-so is my sister. So I say, this is this, uh, my brother to my wife, is her brother-in-law. Right? They call brother-in-law. Right? So, people say, well, he's just like your brother. You should be able to go out the home and leave the two of them together, no problem. But Islam said what? When Prophet ﷺ was asked about the brother-in-law, he said, Alhamu al maut The brother-in-law is death. The brother-in-law is death. Because, though yes, he is brother-in-law, but he can marry you. So Islam says, no, you have to treat him just like any man on the street. You cover yourself, you're not alone with him. Prophet ﷺ said, when two people are alone who can be, could be married, male and female, he said, the third with them is... Satan. So this is the evidence for our intimate friends. <laughs> right? Prophet Sallallahu he said, the third is Satan. So, the whole of Islam calls to a separation between males and females. So the idea of having a boyfriend and girlfriend, intimate friends, that is against the whole practice of Islam, whether it is salah, whether it is two alone by themselves, whether it is a brother-in-law, all of the various systems of Islam say, no, females should be together and males together. So this is why we say boyfriend and girlfriend is not acceptable in Islam. The proof lies in the statements of the Prophet Wasallam, the organization of the prayer, the whole system of Islam opposes it. And of course, the harm from it, the consequence, is clear. Fornication, adultery, you know, illegitimate children, all these kind of things that happen in the societies that don't practice it, it's clear. Okay. Hope we're going to conclude this session now because actually we are running out of time. Next uh, word of thanks, I'd like to call Halia Amit. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen As-salatu wa salam ala ashrafil mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'ina ma ba'd Our honorable guest Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips and dis dignitaries on the dais Katrindi Rislahi Sanda members my sisters and brothers Also we have some uh, brochures from the Qatar Guest Center. This is the Qatar Guest Center where I regularly give lectures on tafsir and uh, aqidah and, and other subjects. Let's pass it out. And you all are welcome to come to the Qatar Guest Center. Uh, it is open uh, all week. 
there are programs there for women and for men, for young uh, people also. You're welcome to come in and share in our activities. Uh, as I said, there is one more um, present remaining that I brought. And uh, let me just ask one question from what we covered tonight uh, to get that last present here. What did Abu Sufyan's mother tell him? Come again? Ah, uh, okay, that's almost. It's not quite. He didn't tell, she didn't tell him to write ten words and see if his cha faith has changed. What did she tell him? Uh -huh. uh, that's, that's almost. <laughs> is it, is it, um, shall we accept that one? Huh? Huh? It's almost, it's not quite. I need somebody to say it a little more accurately. Huh? Come again? Right, if you write ten words, then stop and check yourself to see if your faith has increased or not. Ah, it's almost. Still not quite. Ten words. Yeah, it's still not the number. It's how it's expressed, okay? Yeah, that is it. If you write ten words and your faith has not improved, then check yourself. All right? You're close, and you're closer, but he got it right. Barakallahu feekum, subhanakallahu wa bihamdika, nashadu wa la ilaha ila ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu alaykum. Jazakallahu khair, Dr.